Hello and welcome to another edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show. My name is Andrew Claudio, a.k.a. GMAC, and it's time to preview another Knicks matchup, this time on Thursday night against the Golden State Warriors. They're on TNT National Television, and while the Knicks sit with a much better record than the Warriors, don't let that fool you. They come in winners of eight of their last ten with a pretty decent next rating. Of course, they have have that guy, Steph Curry, and uh, some young pieces that she'll be interested to find out more about too so this isn't your average 29 and 2017 or maybe 30 in 2017 i should mention we're recording this on uh tuesday morning so the game against the wizards for the warriors has not happened but forgive me if i'm just counting that as a game in the win column maybe that's uh easier said than done so i will ask if that is the correct thing to do by bringing on from the Light Years Podcast, it is finally time to speak <laughs> to someone from the Light Years Podcast, uh, Mr. Sam Esfendiari. Sam, welcome to the Nick Swim School Podcast, sir. Appreciate it, man. Um, I sure hope you're right, because uh, I'm not ready for the existential dread that would be our post-game show if they lose to the Wizards. So. Is that because the Wizards are 9-50 and 50 or because Jordan Poole is on the Wizards? Honestly, it's because the Wizards are nine and fifty. It'd be okay. the same thing. If it was the Detroit <laughs> Pistons. I think if it pool randomly went off against them, it would just add a little to it. But there's not a ton of uh, buyers' remorse or w- w- sellers' remorse with trading Jordan Poole. Maybe with the return they got, but you know, um, fans aren't like pining for his return. Right. Well, the way he's played this year, I'm not yeah. super surprised that they're not assuming that this was. Yeah. If he, if he was putting up 28 a game and playing yeah. like, uh, you know, uh, Pete Gilbert Arenas, I'm sure the tenor would be completely different, but that's not what's going on. If I could just go to that real quick, when the yeah. trade was made, was that the fear that they were going to un- not unlock him, but that the the increase in usage and the fact that like I, I remember the conversations of the preseason from certain people that were like, oh, maybe he's, he's going to be in the running for the scoring title. And it's like, I kind of thought he was perfect as a sixth man in Golden State. What, what, what am I missing here? And lo and behold, this season turned into what it was. So, I mean, he always wanted more. Uh, there was a little tension between him and Clay about starting. If you remember back in 2022 when they won the title, they started 28 and six with Jordan Poole in the starting lineup when Clay was still out injured. Clay comes back, obviously a legend of the franchise. He gets a starting spot back. And that was really the beginning of the end of the Jordan Poole Warriors relationship. Like they were just never going to give him the space to expand his game the way he wanted to you throw in a nice little uh one two from draymond and you know we all saw how it was going uh when he got traded i seem to remember the general sentiment being more of we couldn't have got more for him we could have done better than that you know because getting a 38 year old chris paul on an expiring contract uh, a five foot 11 point forget his like history with the warriors over the years it's just like okay, he can't play next to Steph because he's 5'11", right? That sort of thing. There was a lot of kind of like, okay, I get we had you got to move on from him, but this is the best you could do type of thing. Uh, that was the general sentiment. And I guess, I don't know, I guess the, the, the thought from my perspective was I, and maybe this is just my outsider looking in the, the, Way the place that Poole's contract had find had found itself when he was like getting yeah. DNPs and playoff games, like maybe it was a because we went through this with RJ where it was like, okay, is now the time to sell high or has he figured it out or right. do you like? So well, I just I wonder if it was like a let's let make a decision now and you know live with the consequences. When you have a player like that on your team, um, it, you always kind of. Uh, assume their value is a little higher externally than it probably is. Uh, the RJ thing's a reasonable comparison. I don't think he was as bad as Poole was at the very end there. But it's like the whole like... Maybe maybe I'm exaggerating. <laughs> well, no, I, I, can, I can argue he was at the, at the yeah. very end. But the playoffs sure. where he like showed, oh, there's a thing here. Like, is he a, is he a playoff performer? Then you, right. you go to the next season and it's like, oh, did he just figure it out? Like, is this the RJ right, right. Like, that's here to stay? And then his efficiency and, drops and, to like Kobe's last year, you know? And it, just, it is the contract, too. It's like everyone's intrigued to explore whether he can be that guy or not until there's a 30 million year price tag on him. Then it's kind of like, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, I'm going to need him to be that guy before I give you anything for him. Otherwise, you're giving me stuff for him. And I think that's that's what we had to realize was the reality of the pool situation. You know, it's fresh in Warrior fans' minds how well he played in the 2022 playoffs. And you could easily say, okay, well, 2023 was regression. There was a punch. There was a bunch of stuff. But there's a really good player in here, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and you never think about it from the outside view, which is like you gave a guy who's inconsistent a lot of money. I don't know about that, you know. So yeah, yeah. Here we I are. promise I didn't mean to start this whole pod by spending five minutes on Jordan Poole, but I think that that does lead into a larger conversation about what the Warriors season has been. Where you know you you come into this year and there's the Chris Paul of it all. Chris Paul goes out, and I don't know if the dates specifically line up, but the Warriors start playing better. You also mentioned the tension between Jordan Poole and Clay with the starting spot. Clay Thompson goes to the bench and mm-hmm. the Warriors, again, they're eight and two in their last 10. Um, I'm assuming, again, a victory tonight. So just overall, they have played better lately. They're, they're currently in the play in. I have no idea if that should be like, be afraid that they're in the play in because they might, they, like, like, if they get an eight seed, I, I would potentially pick them against if the Timberwolves are a one seed. How are the vibes in Golden State right now with, with the way this season has gone through Route 60 games? So you were saying how the Knicks season has been like three separate seasons. And that's kind of how the Warriors season has been too. And their recent turnaround is really as simple as Draymond is back and locked in. Uh, They started the season pretty strongly with Draymond in lineup, Chris Paul. Yeah, it was kind of a weird fit, but they were winning games. And then we went through the Draymond's going to find a bunch of different ways to get himself ejected and suspended stretch of the season. And the fact they didn't free fall worse than they did during that stretch kind of speaks to like Steph Curry, Steve Kerr, and kind of like the overarching leadership they had on that team. Um, And Chris Paul broke his hand, but it coincided with Draymond coming back. Uh, Since Draymond's been back, they're 11 and four uh, over their last 15. Uh, Three of those four losses were on the last shot, which is a little frustrating. So they're playing some excellent basketball since he's returned. They're top five in every metric during that span. Um, and it's really that simple with Draymond. When Draymond is locked in, he's a special player. He's a difference maker. He also unlocks guys like Andrew Wiggins and Clay Thompson and Kuminga, all of which who are playing subpar or inconsistent at best prior to Draymond's return. Um, since Draymond's come back, Wiggins looks like the guy he looked like in that playoff run where everyone's like, he's figured it out, you know, that sort of stuff. So um, that's the biggest thing. Still, it's hard to not see that they are not beating good teams. They're just not losing. To, they're, they're taking care of business versus the average and the bad teams in the league. And then they run into a Denver. They run into a... Uh, the Clippers. Yeah. And it's just like you see too small, no real second star score, um, multiple issues across the board for the team that just... I don't know. They look like a feisty middle of the road playoff team who might be able to take advantage of a young team in the right matchup. But that's probably where this roster ends at best. So I want to get your reaction. If you could go back in the moment to some recent things, the and honestly, the, 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 the clay going to the bench thing was shocking to me, even though I, I understood that it probably was the correct basketball move, but I remember the conversations last year about right. Jordan Poole and, you know, a lot of this year, like there's a, the Kaminga thing from earlier in the year where he went to sure. Shams and was like, I don't trust Steve Kerr and losing I, faith. I also remember the, <laughs> not, not for nothing, checking in on Warriors Twitter when uh, the, the Jokic bub buzzer beater happened and seeing a lot of like, what is Steve Kerr doing? Sure. And like, I see it a lot on, on our side where Tibbs has been like the best thing that happened to the franchise and like more specifically the, the fact that the Knicks have some stability. Uh, and yet there are still people that are like, what is this coach doing? It's like, I, we're allowed to criticize him, but hold like, let's go to a certain tenor, you know? So like when Kerr finally puts Clay in, put, puts Clay on the bench or makes him come off the bench, what was the reaction when, when that actually happened? I think it was time. I okay. think uh, it's not that Clay needed to go to the bench per se, but it was painfully obvious he was struggling 
Uh, he 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 struggles from this trying too hard type of thing. Like he's so headstrong. He wants to be who he was pre injuries so bad, and he was kind of chasing ghosts. And you could see it with forcing shots and trying to make plays that maybe 2018 Clay could have made, but 2024 post ACL, post Achilles, 34 years old, unrealistic, you know. Uh, and I feel like moving him to the bench was kind of an acceptance that he is in a different phase of his career. They love to mention Miami Heat Ray Allen as kind of like who he could be like. Um, And you know what? Since he's moved to the bench, he feels so much freer to me. It just feels like that weight's off his shoulders. It's like he's accepted the fact like I can still really help a team. I'm just no longer going to be like game six, get you 30 in a pressure moment, Clay. Uh, and maybe he will one day, maybe he'll have those games, but it's like just accepting, like my role is to come off the bench, provide energy, hit some shots instead of like, I'm the man. Um, that's good in general. And, uh, I, I do think it helps with the team's overall vibe. Uh, when you get guys who are clearly hall of famers willing to sacrifice, it just, it makes everything feel a little lighter, a little better in general. So I'm, I'm looking at the game log now. He's still averaging like 28 minutes a game or 27 minutes a game since it's like five minutes less a game, Max. It's not really that big a difference, right? Yeah. And I'm, uh, you tell me, has he closed a, a bit during these four games since since moving to the bench? A little bit, but it's hard to say because in the four games he's come off the bench, uh, the Utah game. Utah mounted a weird comeback where they had to, the Warriors had to put their main guys in. It was just like a dejected closing. The Lakers and Clipper, the Lakers and Hornets game, they just blew them out in three quarters. So there was no so closing time hell. to begin yeah. with. And Denver, yeah, they had them out there, but that one kind of slipped away from them too. They weren't really in it at the end. Come to think of it now that you mention it, since they've put them off the bench, they haven't had one of those classic like, you know, it's 101, 101, four minutes left. All right, let's get our main guys out there. So, well, let's see if against the yeah. Knicks on Thursday, if, <laughs> right, you know, right. this Thibodeau team that, I mean, look, the the post Ananobi Randall thing, it, it feels like it's gone worse than it, it has, where in the last 12 games, they're about six and six. Again, we're recording this before the Knicks take on the Pelicans. So we'll see what happens in that game. But, um, uh, the way that Knicks fans have felt because they were 15 and 14 and two with Ananobi and Randall in the lineup after the trade, they're now like, Oh, we're a 500 team with this new set of uh, players on the team with the, the bogey and, and with Alec Burks in the rotation. Uh, so we'll see if we get a close game down the stretch, how the Warriors play it out with, with whether clay is playing or not. Now going into this season, like with the roster changes, and with the way last season went where they were a six seed, but they upset the the Kings and then get to the second round, but lose to the Lakers. What expectations did you have going in and like how have they changed at, at this point in the year? I think when you have Steph Curry and kind of like the bones of a team that's won four titles, the expectation is always you're going to compete for a title. Uh, and I think as we got into the season, it was woefully clear this roster is not built to contend. And so there was some hope going into the trade deadline. They would make a move that could push them back into it. Because while I do have Denver as a favorite to win it all, I don't think it's overwhelming. Like it is kind of open in some ways. So I was kind of, there was a lot of talk using Chris Paul's expiring contract. Maybe they move off of Wiggins. It might be, you know, they're a move away. What if they get Pascal Siakam? What if that's the, you know, what if that changes things? He's more suited to be your second option. And then Clay doesn't have to, you know, chase ghosts trying to be who he used to be. And everything makes sense. Well, the trade deadline passed. They didn't do any of that stuff. So now it's kind of uh, trying to enjoy the development of Kuminga and Pajemski, who, and to a degree, Trace Jackson Davis. Like they have three very interesting young players who are definitely playing a role um, and kind of, I don't know, enjoy the core for as long as they're here, right? Like Clay could walk in free agency. We don't know, you know, Steph is still playing at that level. Um, and I just don't want to take it for granted. He's going to turn 30, 36 in two weeks, I think. So that's kind of, it's kind of where I'm at. I'm trying to kind of enjoy the fact that like this team probably 
peaks out as a second round team at best. Was the plan from what you could tell from the front office? And this is like the toughest part to navigate when you have a core that won you championships that was part of a dynasty. And then you have younger guys coming in. I think the Spurs are really the only team I've ever seen do it successfully Mm -hmm. with the Parker Ginobili uh, Duncan era making way for this Kawhi, uh, Danny Green. Like those young guys came in and they blended them together to win a title in 2014 and pass the torch. Was that the plan? And is this kind of that transition year where like Kaminga and I'm going to get Pod. Pod, how do you pronounce Pajemski. his name? Pajemski. I'm gonna get his name wrong for a while. I'm gonna I'm gonna work on it. I got Wojnarowski eventually. Well, there pods works because we say Woj instead of Wojnarowski. So uh, the point being, like you have them in the mix and getting prominent, and you have obviously Moody in the mix as well. So I mean, this is I, I don't know how much Knicks fans know about this, but just Google. Joe Lacob two timelines. Mm-hmm. This has been relitigated for five years. Okay. 2019, uh, Kevin Durant leaves. Steph Curry breaks his hand. They have that year where they're dreadful. I mean, if you look at the list of players in that line, like D'Lo, Eric Paschal, Kai mm-hmm. Bowman, I'm going to start. I mean, I, I would be surprised if your listeners knew who Kai Bowman was, for example. You know, like that guy that, Bowman, Eric Pascal went to Villanova. So that's, we, we, we know everybody that went to Villanova now. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is part of the family now. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe you can get him in the off season. Um, Why not? What I was, yeah. <laughs> uh, they had this grand plan of, yeah, wanting to uh, win and develop. And they take James Wiseman. Well, we know how that turned out. Right. Uh, and then it, and then they win a title out of nowhere in 2022. So there's this added pressure of like, yeah, Steph's still that dude. What are you doing with 19 year olds and 20 year olds? Like go all in. Make a move, that sort of thing. Uh, and now we're still kind of in this middle ground of, I don't know, like Steph isn't signing up to be just kind of like the Trojan horse while they rebuild. But sometimes it feels like that. Uh, at the On the other end of the spectrum, you see them like actively shopping guys to make that home run trade, but then bring it back to the other end. But they didn't. They haven't done anything. So it just feels like they're in a weird holding pattern a lot of the time. And I, I feel like, you know, when you're a team with too many shifting priorities, where do you end up? Kind of in the middle, right? Which is where they are. So, you know, you are kind of you are kind of what you set out to be, right? So then going to the just to look ahead a bit to what the West looks like, the teams that they man I just did a Pelicans pod and he was saying how the um the you look at the top of the the West and while you gotta respect what the Timberwolves and what the Thunder have been all this year. Like, if you're a Pelicans fan, I you might have reason to be optimistic about a first round matchup against either team because of how unproven those two teams would be. And I, I know if I, I know on paper the talent and the net rating and the numbers would point to like an overwhelming uh, advantage for Minnesota or OKC against the Warriors. But I'm not like I'd probably pick the Warriors and and, and, like I'd be I wouldn't be shocked if like the Warriors from an eighth seed were to upset a team like Minnesota, like OKC. And I have no idea if that's disrespectful or not, or if it's just like too respectful of the Warriors. So like you tell me, am I am I overrating what the Warriors could be? Am I weighing too much on the pass or is that like how Warriors fans feel like just get us in, you know, they did it to Sacramento last year, right? Sacramento was the better team by every metric. Uh, the young team, they'd never been there and it, they honestly, they could have won the series, but you get to a game seven and Seth Curry takes over. So uh, I don't think it's unfair to say like, look, OKC, I love what you're building. I think you can absolutely win multiple titles with this core, just given how good they are, how young they are. But first time in the playoffs, I, don't, I wouldn't want to go against guys who've been there more than anyone, right? So uh, it's that's kind of a sentiment I hear all the time around here, which is like, all right, well, let's just get to the playoffs. Um, young teams have to prove it. And at least we know that the bones of the Warriors knows how to you know, turn up when it matters. Like Steph knows how to play. Draymond knows how to play. Clay knows how to play, even if he's not the player he used to be. Andrew Wiggins has proven himself in the playoffs. GP2, like you can go down the list. They have enough guys who've been in big playoff moments. It's not just the, you know, the core three, as they like to call themselves. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. 
That's that's how I view it. I think uh, honestly, I think the West is just the Nuggets and everyone else at this stage. So, so you had hinted at that earlier. In fact, you, mm-hmm. hint, you really said that it's like it's probably the Nuggets, but it's somewhat open. If you had to rank the teams, that it's Nuggets and then who, who, and who. I should say the Clippers because they have so many proven veteran stars and Kawhi is terrifying. But the combination of Kawhi, Kawhi hasn't finished a playoffs healthy since 2019. That Yeah, that literally the last, the, the championship the, against the Warriors. Yeah. But if he does stay healthy, they win. So, um, you know, so I don't know what to do with that because when he plays, they're dynamic, they're unguardable. Paul George is a hell of a player. James Harden, as much as I may dislike him, is still a very good player. Russell Westbrook could like they got a lot of stuff going on there. Um, so I'd say them as number two, but like in the back of my mind, I just keep thinking it's like, well, we've seen James Harden in the playoffs and we've seen Kawhi Leonard not finish the playoffs. And those are two pretty important factors. Whereas, you know, Jokic is Mr. Iron Man, right? I'm not like concerned about a Jokic ankle turn in the second round or something, right? So I, I guess I'd say the Clippers and then probably the Wolves. The Wolves haven't been there, but they're the most complete of the young teams defensively, I think. Uh, and I think if you can defend at a high level and you have a superstar, like, let's see what happens. You know, that's kind of how I feel about them. Like, they'll be able to defend and, you know, maybe, maybe this is Ant's coming out party. Maybe it isn't. Where are you on Phoenix? Uh, honestly, I put them closer to the Warriors than the Nuggets. Really? Oh, wow. That's fascinating. They can, they can score. They can really score the ball. I just don't think they have enough to defend. I also think they, they're they just like the Brooklyn Net, KD's Nets. They're just going to fall in love with hunting ISOs in, in the mid-range. And at some point, they're going to run into a better team who can just generate better offense and defend better than them. I don't think they're bad or anything. I just like, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I really do think it's Denver and everyone else, honestly. So I, I, well, I caught the end of the, the Warriors game against the Nuggets that just happened. And that was kind of my takeaway too. So yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't completely disagree with that. I guess there was an autopilot mode that the Nuggets hit last year. And then I right. looked at their playoff run and and that's how it feels with them this year. They're going to be the yeah. three or the four seed. They're going to win a comfortable 54 games, you know, like not try. Like they don't have to try to win 50. They could easily win 60 if they cared to. They're so not, this they is don't. where I was going with it, though, because last year they they knew they could be autopilot to a one seed. And I my, I actually want to ask you the, the question that I've been asking myself about last year's playoff run for the, the Nuggets. How much of an advantage was it that the first two games are like at high altitude in Denver? Like you have to go there, like them having home court throughout the playoffs. How much do you put that into how much it played into their success? I know they lost one road game in the playoffs last year. I guess. Yeah. Did they lose a road game? Oh, they lost two road games, two to the Suns. But like the point being is like you had to they, they literally changed the science of the altitude in factoring in how you had to go play them. How much do you think that mattered to their their dominance in the playoffs? Honestly, I'd put it at less than one percent. Really? I okay. really don't think it, I think it's a regular season factor because you catch a team flying into Denver after they've been in Sacramento the night before tired legs, 24 hours in altitude. You know, they're, you know, feeling it in the mid third, fourth quarter. And the Nuggets are like, yeah, this is home. We don't care. I don't think that stuff really plays in the playoffs. And just watching the way they walked into L.A. and just destroyed the Lakers. That's where I'm kind of like. And they did the same to Miami and Miami and, uh, you know, in Minnesota as well. Like, I don't really think they're as much of uh, what's a good way to put altitude merchants as some like nuggets teams of like our youth, like some of those George Carl teams definitely had an inflated record due to the fact that they could just catch a handful of wins because the altitude. Well, I mean, you know that personally from that, that 2013 team that won 56 games and then ran into the warriors in the playoffs. And like, we played this, we played this pace all the time and we have Steph Curry. Like we, we actually have the best player on the floor. Lo and behold. Um, All right. So maybe that, that that's interesting because I've I've put a little more stock into it. I put it at like five percent, and as to like if because if it's a maybe the Clippers don't have a home court advantage, which is why that's the bad example. But I'm wondering if in a Denver 
Minnesota series that if the first two games aren't at altitude, that the, the that that's the edge that if you were going to give Minnesota an edge, it's like, well, at least we have like the first two games at home. But maybe, like you said, maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I haven't even to be honest, I hadn't thought about that as a playoff edge until you mentioned it to me. Uh, which is just like, maybe I'm giving the Nuggets too much respect, but like, I do kind of think that they're, they're the favorite to win the whole thing. And I kind of, I need to see someone beat them before I, uh, before I pivot off that take. As you well know, when you win the title, that's, that's a, that's an earned respect. It's like, I now have to see someone beat you before I predict that you will be beaten. And look, that, that was literally the take for three years in the NBA with the sure. Warriors. I was just like, I'm just not picking against them. The next three years are, are kind of, you know, their, their, their title to win until they don't. Um, now, we may be coming to an end of that that era and that that, that quote-unquote dynasty. And, uh, you know, this, this season you mentioned might be the end of the, the core three, as, as they said. So what does a disappointing end to this season look like? Uh, not making the playoffs would be disappointing. I think I'm looking at it this way. Um, I think Steph has multiple years where he can still lead a title team. Mm-hmm. I do not think that title team will be built in the same fashion as the previous ones. Like it's not him. Clay as a second option with Draymond being like the factor. So I'd like to see them make the playoffs, make a little noise and put pressure on the front office to, uh, go find a true second star to put around Steph to take advantage of his last couple of years um, of being an elite superstar. I know he's turning 36, but I just have no reason to believe he can't be an impact player until he's 38, 39, given the way that other players are aging and giving the way that he shoots the ball in his game is. Uh, that would be my preference. Disappointment would be if they completely flame out, don't even get out of the play in. Um, I do think they'll make the play in just because there's a gap between the 10 and the 11. And I, I can't see those teams like Utah and Houston jump in the teams in the plan right now. Um, and front office decides to lean harder into a rebuild when you have Steph still playing at this te- this level. There's no, this is a stupid question, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. There's no like nuclear button to hit on this, this roster, right? There's no version. There's no version where Steph's on a different team and you just get do you the, want to be the that owner? You want. Do you want to be the owner who trades Steph Curry? I don't. That's why I, I figured it was a stupid question, you know? They bought the team in 2010 for three hundred fifty or four hundred million dollars, which is a record valuation at that time. Go look up the Forbes list right now. Second most valuable franchise behind the Cowboys in all pro sports at like near 10 billion. Uh yes, it takes a lot of things to make a franchise successful. But having a global iconic superstar who turns a ton of people into fans of your team is probably the biggest one. So I think Steph's safe for eternity. You just broke that news to me that they passed the Knicks in evaluation, by the way. I had no idea that they had passed the Knicks. They're, I'm like sorry. You said, sorry I, well, for James Dolan. This is where... Yes, I am, I'm also sorry for, for James <laughs> Dolan. Um this is where I, I can't believe I'm actually going to do this. They're technically the third most valuable franchise ah, behind the Cowboys and, and the Lakers. No, those dorks in the Bronx here in New York. Uh, oh, that's Yankees. true. Yeah. yeah. Apologies. So, I did find it. You yeah, don't have to I, apologize. I get, you know, they, they talk about their history enough. So they don't, I'm a Mets fan, so I'm allowed to. They just, they're just living off it. I'm, I'm fully aware. Yes. Um, uh, believe me, so am I. I get reminded when people with Navy hats tell me they can count to 27 on a daily basis. Just go steal Juan Soto from them next off season. Make Man, me happy. I, that, <laughs> it's it's my goal for this year. I will tolerate a season of mid if you're the Mets. Just be aggressive mm-hmm. next year, and I'll take it. Um, so I've, I mean, speaking of teams that wear blue and orange in New York, the Knicks have had an interesting season. And like I, I was saying to you before the pod, the three different versions of the Knicks season that we've had, where you're kind of a 500 team for the first two months, and around New Year's you make this. This Ananobi trade that sh- shook up the team and honestly shook up the fan base because it was like, wait, we we loved quickly, we loved RJ. Oh, Ananobi's the perfect fit for this team that they go fourteen and two in their first sixteen games with him, and then he gets hurt along with Randall, and now we're a five hundred team again. 
Um, what's your perspective? And if you if you have any questions about how the season's gone for for the Knicks, what have what what you been like? I do feel like okay, so you're getting the full OG Anobi experience, right? Mm-hmm. You get him, and that is an impact player. Like he just, I don't care what his numbers are, he impacts winning on yes. many levels. And then you get the other half of the OG experience, which is this is a bizarre injury to be out twelve games with. Um, yeah. I'm sure Raptor fans have told you about the two sides of it. That's just kind of who he is as a player. Uh, I kind of, I, I mean, I like this Knicks team. I, I'd be lying if I said like Jalen Brunson's not my favorite non-warrior right now. Like I just yeah. enjoy everything about the way they play the game. Like it's, <laughs> it's very um, honest is the best way I'd put it. Like they play hard every night. They're not the most talented team. They're not the least talented team either, but like no, you know, they don't have the firepower the Nuggets have, for example, right? Like that sort of thing. But I believe, I really do believe that you can win a title built around Jalen Brunson, the way they're doing it. I just think you need an upgrade. Honestly, probably Julius Randle's position. I'm sure that's not a hot take. I'm sure that's it's one the, that it's the most debated conversation that we that we have. Like, is the what's the Julius upgrade if you need to make the Julius upgrade? I just let me ask you who's who's the upgrade? Like what who are we going after that and like the I thing mean, that's who's that's available tough, is always the first <laughs> there's that part. And then there's the like like if Carl Anthony Towns has been brought up and it's like do you just surround Jalen with spacing, right? You actually add a true mm-hmm. three point shooter at the four. The problem with that is like the financials. You're ter- you're currently on a discount with Julius because he doesn't have a max. You trade for Cat. That's your move. Like that is your move for the next however many years. So the financial flexibility that the Knicks have created by all of these bargain deals with Josh Hart and Divincenzo and Hartenstein, that's just gone. And uh, like honestly, and Brunson and Randall. Not they don't don't have anybody on a max at the moment. You trade for Cat. That's your move. So like. Is that, in your opinion, would that be like a good enough move to make that like it's tricky, right? Yeah. Cause yeah. I could see I think they'd be better with Kat instead of Julius Randle, but are they good enough? And I'm not convinced they'd be good enough. And to your point, now they'd be locked into that team being like they wouldn't have a move to go get like a I don't know, like a Shea Gilders Alexander if he came available in three year, or two years or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um it's tricky. So I I kind of applaud the Knicks for being a little more pragmatic with it. I feel like a previous Knicks era would have chaotically traded Randall be- when they sniffed the eight seed and it probably would have been the wrong move and they would have been locked into a team that sucked or something like that. Um, so I applaud them kind of taking the big picture view on it because, you know, Brunson's, what is he, 26, 27, something like that? 27, yeah. <clears throat> you, got, you got some years here. Like he's not, you know, he's not declining or anything. Um yeah, I uh, it's, it's, I think the, uh, the, old, the Knicks of older Donovan Mitchell's a Nick. Like if that's correct, Nick correct, and like all the assets are gone. Now I'm someone that defends the Carmelo Anthony trade. Mm-hmm. I more criticize Funny every enough, move that was made the, after. <laughs> the peak version of Melo is actually the correct player to replace Julius well, Randle. With. <laughs> yes, actually, <laughs> which is which is why I tell I a lot of people get that a 2013 I, time machine. So it's what um, I, when I have the conversation, it's like I'd love to put mellow the mellow trade to happen now, and then I trust this front office to do all the correct moves and like not amnesty Chauncey Billups, which means you're stuck with the Amari contract and not trade a first round pick right, for right. Andrea Bargnani and. You know, like all the moves you made afterwards were the problem. It's less about the actual trade for Mello. Um, the point that I, I think I've enjoyed about this Knicks team is the for a while it was like the underdog. Like we're just we're just happy to be here. And I think that's what the month of January did to this fan base and just recalibrating everything. Where like the two losses they had with Ananobi were like this weird game against Dallas where they screwed around for three and a half quarters and then they decided to actually take the game seriously and they were rebound away from winning. Then Jalen Brunson didn't play in the other loss and they were still a rebound away at the end of the game from beating Orlando. Outside of that, they had like a 15 net rating over the other 15, uh, 14 other games that they won. So it's like tough to, like you said, you could build a championship team around Jalen Brunson. There were illusions. I don't know if you, you tell me how crazy it was. The Knicks, Knicks fans were like, you know what? Why not us? Like, why can't we, 
hanging around with Boston in a seven game series with this roster. I, you know what? I still don't think it's improbable. Like, I, would I favor Boston? Yes. Oh, of course. Could yeah, I see yeah. the Knicks beating them? Yes. Cause I think mm. uh, OG, OG is just the exact perfect player to harass Tatum and just take them out of their game that way. I don't think they really have an answer for Jalen Brunson. It's going to be kind of a dogfight series in general yeah. For, yeah. The, for the Knicks. So it's like, <laughs> I don't know. I think they're in a very good spot. I think they're still kind of a second tier team. So they're kind of sitting there. And sometimes that can be frustrating because you, you know, you got something good, you know, you're like on the doorstep, but you also know you can't get through the door and (laughs) it's hard to like figure out when is the right time to be like, you know what? Fuck it. Like, let's just, let's just, let's see, let's see how cat works. You know? Well, I think that's what this off season for the Knicks is going to be. And I don't know if it's going to be cat. I know that, like it's after, just the, a, he's a the name conversation. Oh, uh, believe me, CAA yeah. client went to Kentucky. Mm-hmm. We have put him in the pool of guys that will Relatively potentially well. be will be, will be in the Knicks on the Knicks radar. Um, look, the Embiid question is always going to be the 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 home run swing that a lot of Knicks fans are are looking to take. I don't know if he's going to become available. Everybody I talk to in Philly is like he wants to be a Sixer for life, and then you know I, I heard that about Dame, and then. Suddenly sure. he was traded. So, you know, we'll we'll see. Last question before I let you get out of here. I hinted at the Mount Rushmore of rivals. Um, this is a question I ask every guest I have on the pregame pod because I want I want to find out who like the four teams are that you get up for on the NBA calendar, whether it be like the current state of the Warriors, who the four teams that that you, you hate the most, or like historically, like does that factor in? So you tell me the Mount Rushmore of Warriors rivals. Number one is easy. It's the Lakers. Okay. Um, every Northern California team has a rivalry with the Southern California team. You throw LeBron on the Lakers. There's obviously a lot of history there. Uh, it's just always going to be the one that gets people the most excited, brings out the most anger, whatever it may be. Right. Um, I'd throw Sacramento next closest geographic rival had that playoff series set the Lakers view the Warriors as like an annoying little brother. They pull out their rings thing all the time and that sort of thing. The Warriors view the Sacramento Kings as their annoying little mm. brother doing okay. that. So they, they like to talk about like, oh, we're better than the Warriors now. You guys had your time. And they're, they're, in general, if you know the markets, uh, it's like this isn't a perfect analogy, but it's like Philly to New York is Sacramento to the Bay Area. Like okay. a, geographically, yeah. What What is it? An hour and a half to two hour drive? But like two hours, yeah, two hours. Yeah, probably no closer traffic. to an, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably two hours here because yeah, traffic exists in general. <laughs> but it's like ninety-five miles, San Francisco to Sacramento, um, and then in general, like you know, one city's got a little more uh, like allure and stuff going on than the other. So that's number two. Hmm. Number three would be ah. I would see. Here's the thing. I would say the Houston Rockets, but all the characters who made that rivalry gone are no longer in Houston anymore. And one of them is literally on the Warriors right now. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe the Clippers. It it just never feels the same. Like it doesn't feel like there's true bad blood there. Like a lot of the Warriors bad blood and fun rivalry stuff is related legitimately to like Chris Paul, James Harden. And if they're not on those teams anymore, it loses that luster to a degree, right? So I I might say the Boston Celtics, honestly. It's not like full-on rival, but the Warriors ownership group who took over in 2010 were former Celtic minority owners. They brought a bunch of Celtics people. There's a lot of synergy between the two organizations front office wise. Danny Ainge famously recommended Bob Myers to the Warriors as like a GM candidate. Um, And they love to compare themselves and like match up with them. They try to play similar styles of basketball. It's always a fun thing when they play the Celtics, basically. I also think Boston and San Francisco have the same relationship with LA and New York where they're kind of like, For better or worse, there's a little of that. They're kind of, for big cities, they're kind of provincial. You know what I mean? Like the way they act. Um, So I think there's a little bit there. 
And this is me stalling because I can't figure out a fourth team. I'll go the Phoenix Suns. I was going to say, where's Phoenix? Yeah. Got got our old friend Kevin over there. Um, It's just fun. Fun to go up against them. Fun to feel them in that capacity. It is interesting. I'm thinking about like who the the games would be. And it was like, you know, Houston when they had Harden or Portland with Dame because of that local thing. And, you know, and players move on. And now those rivalries mean nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's one that. Speaking of it no longer meaning anything because players move on, there's one that I was curious if they would come up, and it's because when I talked to Justin of the Chase Down, he mentioned the Warriors, and it's like the Cavs. Are they do they factor at all into your consideration here? Un- unfortunately, LeBron James is in L.A., so okay. that was um, a LeBron generated rivalry. You're saying I kind of like it's okay. it's just because the Warriors core is so it's still the same main characters, you know, Uh, Mm -hmm. whereas like the teams have moved on. It is fun to play Cleveland because you look at the gym and it's like, man, I remember so many classic games in this gym and the uniforms and that sort of thing. Uh, But it just doesn't feel the same because they have none of the same players. Yeah. They have one guy remaining and it's Tristan Tristan. Thompson. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So uh, that's how I feel about it. But I do, I do get nostalgic when we play against the Cavs because it brings up, Good, bad. It brings up memories one way or another. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, I guess we'll see. I think the Clippers, uh, they, they make more sense in this in this calculation because like Kawhi did also win a title in Golden State than the, the last game in uh in um in Oracle. Oracle, yeah. So um I guess you could you could factor that and I don't know where Paul George plays into the, the conversation, but uh between Harden and Kawhi, maybe that's the fun playoff matchup we get this year in like a two seven. Uh, uh, series this year, but um, you know, I, I the the Warriors are the team that's mattered the most over the last decade in the NBA, I think, and it's like, I mean, if this is the end of the run, I'm sure you as a fan have been like, I mean, if you want to, for, for the very last question, like, take me to, uh, like, before the Warriors did all this, like, if you had ever imagined that, like, four like no, four titles and all of this later, you know, I could have imagined them one day winning a title in the way that every fan imagines their mm-hmm. team one day winning a title. I could never imagine them having a player who will go down on like Mount Rushmore of most influential players in the game. Like Steph is, he's everything to this franchise, but like he just, when you talk about basketball history, he will be one of the five to 10 names who gets mentioned by first name only that everyone knows about because of their impact. And then just turning the Warriors into kind of a global brand. Like it's the weirdest thing for me when I have people who are outside of the United States yelling at me on Twitter saying I'm a fake fan or something. I'm like, bro, I've been going to games for over 30 years. I promise you. I, there's nothing fake about. I wish I was a fake fan more than sometimes, you know. But it just like speaks to like the global nature of it, and just like I could have never imagined any of that. And so, if it's the end, it's the end. Like I've already made peace with like I'm happy to watch Steph decline and be bad for multiple years because he's given us more moments than you could ask for from like they've like if they never do anything for the rest of this iteration. Four titles is still a very nice, yeah, very nice run, right? You know what I'm saying. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. Mixed with um, the the brain part of me is like, but they could still get one more, so they should try to do it. You know? So. Yeah, yeah. I think the look. I have no ill will against the Warriors, which is why this is different for me. But like watching what the Patriots fizzled out to was the like. I don't think you think there's an accurate comp because Brady left, but I knew. I, I've met a, a Patriot fan because they like to annoy Jets fans about their dominance over them. Um, but they're like, yeah, I remember the the 90s versions of this team, like the pre Bledsoe version of the team. And then suddenly this coach and this this player showed up. And they become iconic. Yeah, Right. And now the Patriots, regardless of the fact that they went whatever, four and 13 last year, I was terrified every time. Like, oh, you know what? They probably can cover this spread. Oh, no, they lost 40 to three. Never mind. Um, and that's obviously not the Warriors. They're more competitive than that. But I think 
to your point, that's what has been established is the Warriors get mentioned in the same vein as the the Lakers and the Knicks and the more valuable franchises, literally on the Forbes list, more valuable franchises. These were things I could have never imagined. Like I would go to games at Oracle for like you could get in the door with a student ID for 10 bucks, that type of oh, stuff, wow. like 15 bucks. Like when I was in high school, that sort of stuff. Now maybe people listening to this would just be like, nah, dude, you're just fucking old. But, uh, <laughs> but like, you know, like I, they were the team that would market the opposing star coming into town, you know, come see Kobe and the Lakers take on your warriors. And you're just like, whenever you're in that space, you're, you're not a valuable franchise. Um, and so it's just, it's, uh, sometimes I have to be reflective of the fact that like they really did it. They made this, they made this a destination team. They may never be the destination they were in the tens where they got Kevin Durant and that sort of thing, but they're no longer a joke franchise. Um, and so, yeah, if, if they fizzle out a little bit, it's so be it. Yeah. And like to the, the comp that I just made on that Forbes list that I got in front of me, the team that is right there with them in evaluation tied tied for third, the New England Patriots. So that's that's the company that the that the Warriors find themselves in. Yeah, my only hope is I don't have to get the Steph Curry version of Brady's Tampa years. Like that's I, well, really yeah. That's yeah. I I want it like to me. If you asked me, would you rather see one more title, but Steph retires on a different team, or Steph retires on the Warriors? I think I'd say Steph retires on the Warriors. Really? So I Steph just, wins I, a fifth ring, but then leaves two years later. You don't want that. I don't I, like you want him to play his whole career last, in one uniform. He might be the last guy who does a 20 year stint on one team. So there's, there's levels to this though, because if you're saying the Brady Tampa years, you're also saying like he wins another in another right. uniform. So that's would be, more than anything, what you don't want. I would be happy for him. I would cheer for him. I'd buy a Steph Curry, Miami heat Jersey, uh, couldn't but, say he went to the Knicks. Like you couldn't say that sorry, that title was sorry. Nick no. no, I had to. I had you had to, make to say it, it was them. You went to our rivals. You went to the Miami Heat for that. Where he don't, gets the last. Don't title. lie though. Who who could you see Steph going to at age thirty eight and somehow do, he, they're on I, the short list? Yeah, yes. they they are the short list because it, it all seems to work out for the Heat. But I think it's more <laughs> like the Knicks get Steph and then the Heat gets a cashier from Publix. And the Heat still upset the Knicks in that series. Like that's more the, the direction I think that would go. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I don't. I just want him to like. I think it's it. This is undoubtedly the best era uh, era of Warriors basketball in their franchise's history. Like, no disrespect to Will to Rick Barry. Mm-hmm. They didn't have this kind of success. And even if they are good post staff, and at some point they will be, I highly doubt they'll ever be this successful again. You know. Uh, in terms of like a dynastic decade long run with six finals appearances, four rings. Um, I think it just means something to have Steph retire with your team. Um, have him be viewed the way Tim Duncan's viewed, Dirk Nowitzki's viewed, Kobe Bryant's viewed as 20 year, one franchise guy, synonymous. You, you name the Warriors, you think Steph Curry, you know, that sort of thing. I always thought that, I mean, I'm, Respect to Tom Brady for winning one with Tampa and sticking it to the Patriots, but I always felt like that's a black mark on Belichick. Like, Mm. great coach, but I'm like, you really ran that guy out of town because your ego, like, you you guys are getting what you deserve with this, like, period of irrelevance. I know you're loving this. I'm I'm just sitting back (laughs) and enjoying. Yeah. yeah. Um, And I, I just think, like, karma and the way those things play out, like, let him retire, even if you suck when he retires. Let it let it end the right way. That matters to me. I guess we'll see what happens with the Warriors in the in the not too distant future. Um, we'll start with the present, which is this matchup on Thursday night. Be they fun take one. on the where they take on the Knicks at the Garden on TNT for that matter. So the world will get to watch uh, this matchup on Thursday. Sam, this was great to finally do this and link up for a pod. Before you get out of here, please let the fine folks at home know where they can find you and the Light Years podcast. Yeah, I mean, Light Years you can find on every platform you listen to pods. Apple, Spotify, Post Video Pod on YouTube. And if you want to partake in the live show, we go live on playback after every game. So Warriors Knicks ends 7 p.m. Pacific time, give or take. On Thursday, we'll be live on playback. I'll tweet out the link for anyone who follows me, Andy, or our main accounts on Twitter, and then it'll be up on all the pod feeds within an hour or two after that. 
There you go. We're obviously, I mean, I don't want to give too much away about where your day job is, but like we are very familiar with playback and have had a good relationship with them for years. So um, our, our audience knows the playback game well. So that's how you can find Sam and the Light Years crew when they're after every game. Uh, again, Sam, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you, everybody out there for tuning in to this edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show. If you dig it, please like the video. Remember to subscribe. If you're listening on the pod feed later, please leave a five star rating and a review. I will be back on Sunday to preview the Knicks matchup against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, But until next time, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the game tonight, and I'll speak with you soon. Peace.